Hi friends, welcome. We're just gonna wait a moment whilst people join us. People are still entering the room, so we'll just give 30 more seconds before we get started. Okay, let's begin, shall we? So welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you all here. Um, we'd love to know who is joining us and where you're joining us from. So please feel free to share that in the chat box. Um, for myself, my name is Alicia Rinkowska. I'm the development coordinator at Christian Peacemaker Teams, and I'm joining you today from Chicago. Uh, just for those of you who might not know us, uh, Christian Peacemaker Teams, or CPT as we're otherwise known, is an organization that trains everyday people to work in local peacemaker communities that are confronting situations of lethal conflict, partnering with them to transform violence and oppression. So tonight we're gonna to be holding a screening of our webinar from Turtle Island to Palestine, Understanding Settler Colonialism. Uh, this was a webinar that took place originally back in April um, and it was presented by our CPT Canada coordinator, Rochelle, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Um, the reason that we decided to screen it once again is because for the month of August, CPT has been focusing on Indigenous rights and resistance. And you already may have seen some of our articles or watched our previous webinar on Indigenous re uh, resistance that we took place earlier this month. And I will be sharing a link to that shortly. Um, I also want to say that we are going to be dedicating a good amount of time after the screening of the webinar to an in-depth Q&A discussion. So we're, we're looking at pro approximately an hour to an hour and a half of time so that we can really get in and answer a lot of your questions. Um, and that's why I ask you to please put any questions that come up as you're watching this webinar in the Q&A box. It should be located at the bottom of your screen and that way we can get through as many questions as possible in, in the next um, sort of half hour after this uh, webinar screening. And I'm just going to give a brief um, introduction to Rochelle, who you'll see in the, in the screening of this webinar. So Rochelle is, as I mentioned, CPT's Canada coordinator and is based out of Toronto. She has previously worked in Bethlehem, Palestine for five years doing peace and human rights work and has done accompanying work in Iraqi Kurdistan, the US-Mexico borderlands and Turtle Island. Rochelle studied the similarities of settler colonialism between Canada and Israel at York University. I'm just going to hand over to Rochelle to say a quick hello. Hello, welcome everybody. It's so excited. Uh, it's so exciting to be here again today and to be sharing this presentation with you. And I look forward to the discussion and the questions uh, after the screening. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Just one final reminder um, to please put your questions in the Q&A box. And in just a second, I'm gonna be turning off my camera and sharing my screen so that we can get started and watch uh, the webinar. So give me one moment as I attempt to do that. And I also just want to acknowledge that I'm doing this presentation today um, from Toronto, which is the Dishwick One Spoon Territory, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Wendat. And I also want to acknowledge that the land that I'm currently on is land that has never been uh, ceded or relinquished by the nations um, of this land. So I'm a guest on this land or potentially an invader on this land. I do identify as a settler. And as we talk about settler colonialism, one thing I also want to mention is that due to the violence of settler colonialism, myself and my ancestors have benefited a lot from this violence. I have not experienced the structure and some of the things we'll be talking about uh, firsthand, 
Rather, these are learnings that I have received uh, from CPT partners, both from Turtle Island and from Palestine. <clears throat> And so today we are going to be talking about understanding settler colonialism. And I think this is a really important topic for us to speak about um, if we want to undo settler colonialism. We first have to understand the structure and what makes up settler colonialism for us to know how to resist settler colonialism. And so today I'm going to be sharing with you some political theory. I'm going to be sharing with you some stories, some maps, and some pictures. So my hope is whatever your learning style and preference is, is that you'll be able to receive something out of this presentation. And of course, we're gonna have technical difficulties. Uh, one moment here. Uh, Alicia, can you just confirm that you can see the slide, what is settler colonialism? Yes, we can see it, Rochelle. Okay, so I just want to point out, um, there are differences between settler colonialism and traditional forms of colonialism. That is not to say that one is more violent or one is better than the other, uh, but there are different ways um, these colonialisms express themselves. And so traditional colonialism, is the process where uh, folks from, let's say, the European Empire or Britain go abroad and they land somewhere, colonize it for the sake of resource extraction. And so they are taking silver, gold, uh, agriculture, labor, people, and they are taking it back to the motherland for the purpose of the motherland's economy and the empire itself. Where settler colonialism is different is that settlers are invaders and they are coming to stay. They are coming to stay and they are coming to impose their own system of culture and government, governance and economy onto this land that they are on. So rather than it being an event situated in the past, it's an ongoing structure. And this is something that's important to remember, especially for myself, as I live in Canada or Northern Turtle Island, and Canadian society and the Canadian government likes to celebrate itself as being multicultural, as being supportive of human rights, of being anti-racist and working towards reconciliation. Except that this structure of settler colonialism has never been dismantled here. And this structure is something that is happening in Palestine as well. So key to settler colonialism is this constant need for the settler state to acquire land. They're constantly taking more and more land uh, for the purpose of settler expansion, capitalism, and industry. And in order to do so, indigenous people must always be disappearing from this land. And so I'm gonna be talking a bit about how this has been playing out in Palestine and in Turtle Island. But I also want to point out that this structure of settler colonialism has played itself out in Australia, in the United States, uh, in South Africa as well. There's one other thing that I need to acknowledge in this presentation is that this settler colonial structure I think is rooted in white supremacy. And so there are various ways the structure targets all people of color. Uh, we don't, I don't have enough time today to go into um, how that plays itself out as well. Potentially there could be a part two to this presentation at some point, uh, but I want to acknowledge that, but I will be focusing on how this system and structure impacts indigenous people uh, on Turtle Island and Palestinians. So these are the ways I, I will be <clears throat> talking about how, how indigenous people are disappeared um, and it's through historical narratives of discovery, creating borders to control the land, to fragment the land and contain indigenous people. And I also want to point out that sometimes when I say indigenous people, um, I'm also referring to Palestinians because Palestinians are the indigenous people uh, of Palestine. It's also done through really bureaucratic systems um, of governance. So bureaucratic systems of who gets citizenship, what does citizenship look like? Given your identification from the government, how are you allowed to live and operate in space and land? 
I will be focusing briefly on the military occupation and imprisonment of indigenous people, but I'm gonna spend more time speaking on the other topics, just because the occupation and the imprisonment part is really important to look at, but it's a very overt way the system plays itself out, and I wanna look at more of the subtle ways settler colonialism plays itself out. And I also wanna spend time addressing what this, the settler mob uh, and how they work to create insecurity and vulnerability on indigenous populations. So indigenous people through settler colonialism, their erasure begins uh, through historical narratives of discovery. As I'm sure many of you folks know, Turtle Island was colonized due to the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery was a papal, papal bull that went out in the 1500s that said that the European empire had a moral and legal right to claim lands where folks were not, not Christian. So because on Turtle Island, the indigenous people that were here were not Christians, they were considered heathen, and therefore they were considered not human. So the Christian, the empire was able to, decided it was morally acceptable and legal to colonize here. And because indigenous people were considered not human, it created this idea of terra nullius, that this land was empty for the sake of taking it over for settlers to come and make this wonderful land of milk and honey uh, profitable uh, through agricultural and other means. And it's something that we see with Zionism as well. So political Zionism began in the late 1800s and political Zionism used religious doctrine uh, in order to create their nation state. And this they used religious doctrine that the Jewish people were given physical pieces of land uh, by God, so that God was somehow an arbiter and being able to hand out physical pieces of land, uh, and they had given the land of Pal God had given the land of Palestine to the Jews. Prominent European Zionist uh, Israel Zangwill articulated the slogan that Palestine, or Israel, was a land without a people for a people without a land, and this was a very popular slogan and yet Palestinians were there and so in this very slogan we can see that Palestinians have been wiped out from the historical narrative. Their, <clears throat> their ancestry, their history, um, their cultural practices are not there. In, in the very birth of this narrative Palestinians do not exist. And I want to just point out that this discovery narrative is really key um, well, it's not as prominent in Israel and Palestine, it is very key to the Canadian ethos um, and fabric of our society. This is a old Ontario license plate whose mantra was, Ontario is yours to discover. So furthering that, the idea that Ontario has these empty places and that we, myself, as a settler, uh, as someone who's driving a vehicle, um, has the opportunity to discover these new lands on my own. Another way indigenous people are removed from the land is by creating borders, fracturing and controlling the land. So the slide on the left is a picture of Turtle Island and the traditional boundaries of the multiple nations that exist on Turtle Island. And I wanna point out that it's not just one nation that was here, oftentimes the, the state will talk about indigenous people as if they are just one group. Uh, it was multiple nations that existed here prior to contact. And these were the traditional boundaries. Now these boundaries were not like the modern nation state boundaries. There was no custom control officers. These boundaries were often shifting. But I just wanna show what these natural, um, what these natural groupings sort of look like. And then at contact through settler colonialism, we get the boundaries on the right. Canada, United States, Mexico, the lines are not drawn according to what previous nations uh, lived. The lines are drawn by the, the settler colonial states. And yet the lines keep 
being drawn throughout settler colonialism. And one of the ways in which the lines were being drawn was through the process of treaties. Now treaties were agreements that were negotiated uh, between indigenous nations and the Canadian state or the crown in reference to the queen. So these are the treaties that were created. Um, and again, I want you to look, these boundaries here of the treaties do not follow the traditional boundaries of the slide on the left. So these treaties were done in part through negotiation, also done through coercion, and a lot of deception and violence took place. Now Canada's understanding of the treaties was that indigenous people were surrendering, surrendering their land. So the Canadian state had this idea that land was a commodity. It could be owned uh, for personal benefit and controlled that way. And through treaties, indigenous people were surrendering and giving up their land. Now, many indigenous uh, understandings of the treaties was that one, land is not something that can be actually owned. It was a gift from the creator and that through the treaties, there would be a process of land sharing so that settlers and indigenous people would be able to live and exist on this land together in a nation to nation relationship. Now, part of the reason um, the indigenous people had this understanding was because the treaties were often written in English and then translated into indigenous language. Many things were left out in the, trans in the oral translation of what indigenous leaders were signing. Um, many indigenous people thought the agreement said one thing and then signed and it turned out it said something entirely different. I also wanna point out that there were quite a few leaders that resisted signing these treaties. And I think about Chief Big Bear, uh, who's in tre from Treaty 6 in Saskatchewan, who refused to sign the treaties because he thought it would destroy, destroy uh, the culture of his people. However, the Canadian state um, restricted his tribe, and eventually Chief Big Bear was faced with the reality that his people were going to be starved to death by the Canadian state if he did not sign the treaty. And so many of the Indigenous communities were forced under the threat of violence and under the threat of starvation into signing these agreements. And then through settler colonialism, indigenous people were removed from the land and placed into very small tracts of land called reserves. And so I just wanna go back and forth for a second. Here again, you see on the left, all of Turtle Island, where indigenous people were living um, in community, traveling, and they were forced onto tracts of land where these little red dots are, reserves. For a while in Canadian history, um, it was not allowed to leave the reserve unless you had a pass from the Canadian state. And so you can see how Indigenous communities in Canada have been slowly pushed into these contained, isolated communities. In Canada, there are over 3,100 reserves across, across Canada. Uh, and I think at a time, this has always been a significant issue, but I think it becomes even more atrocious during this time as we're dealing with the global pandemic, that there is mass amounts of inadequate housing on a reservation, on reservations across Canada, and poor sanitation. So many reserves across Canada do not have adequate access to clean, potable drinking water. And at a time when the opportunity for social distancing is important, um, and the opportunity for sanitation is important, this becomes particularly scary. So today, the reserve system only represents 0.2% of Canada's total land mass. And the reason why Indigenous folks were pushed off their territory into these containable reserves was so that uh, settlers could come, build urban communities that were often far away from reserves, um, and that the settler colonial state could expand without having to keep in mind indigenous populations. And this is something that we've seen through the history of Palestine as well. And so the, slide, the map on the left um, is a map of Palestine of 1947. Now I wanna point out that prior to 1947, uh, you can see that there's Palestinian land and Jewish communities. Uh, Jews and Palestinians uh, prior to the rise of 
political Zionism, uh, did live in relative peace. Not to say that there weren't tensions, but they did live together in relative peace. It was this notion of political Zionism that really started uh, to create the tension. Now, after the horrors and the atrocities of the Holocaust, uh, the international community, and by the international community, uh, this is really the West, so Europe, North America, decided that Jews needed a land to feel safe and to create their own state. So they proposed the partition plan, and that's what the second map looks like, is the partition plan. So even though Palestinians weren't responsible for the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe, uh, that, that caused the Holocaust, the Palestinians were not responsible for turning the boats of, of Jews trying to flee Europe in the U.S., where the U.S. turned away boats uh, of Jews trying to flee Europe. Palestinians weren't responsible for that either. They were supposed to now make way for a new state on their land. Palestinians rejected this because why should the majority of the population have to give up the majority of the land? 1948, war breaks out. Then war breaks out again in 1967, and you get the third map there. And in, after 1967, Palestine becomes the West Bank and Gaza, and they become under uh, Israeli military occupation. And this is where we see the process of settler colonialism more and more on this land, until you get to present day, where you see in the West Bank there, these small islands, of Palestinian controlled areas that are not connected um, and under, under the pseudo control of the Palestinian Authority. And what that looks like more closely in the West Bank is this. So this is the international, internationally recognized Green Line. Within that you have Israeli settlements, you have Israeli outposts. So these are places where Israeli settlers are moving into. You have the wall that goes in and around the West Bank, uh, confiscating more land and water as it goes. All of this creates settlement blocks, so blocks of settler territory well within inside the West Bank. You have the Eastern Segregation Zone, which is under Israeli military control, and uh, Palestinians face a lot of restrictions in that area. You have Israeli controlled roads. So in the West Bank, you actually have uh, roads in the, that are built on Palestinian land, uh, but Palestinians are not allowed to drive on these roads. And just to point out that even at the time of the, the, the height of apartheid in South Africa, um, there weren't ever segregated roads. And yet in the West Bank, there currently are a few roads that are segregated. And then you have Palestinian areas A and B, which is supposed to be areas where Palestinians have control. But again, you can see Palestinians have been pushed from the territory into these small controlled contained spaces and all around them is settler colonial, the settler colonial infrastructure of Israel. And so I wanna just take a moment to talk about the walls that divide. So the picture on the top, my top left, um, is a picture of the wall from inside Ida refugee camp in Bethlehem. So this is one way the settler colonial state uh, divides and fractures land is by concrete walls. Now this wall is built right up alongside Ida refugee camp and I want to point out that the olive grove beyond that wall is actually um, an olive grove belonging to the people of Bethlehem. And yet when Israel built this wall, the folks who own those trees were now separated from their trees. And to be able to har harvest the olives, um, access the trees, they now needed a permit from the state to be allowed to access uh, those trees, creating a lot of restrictions and movement and being able to access land as well as economic destruction. So you have physical walls that create boundaries and restrict movement. But then I wanna point out the slide on the top right. And this is a picture of Winnipeg. Now Winnipeg, when Winnipeg was developed, um, there was the, the, wealthy, the wealthy capitalist class, so the, the, the business leaders of Winnipeg living on the south side of the tracks. They made the decision to develop the north side of the tracks with the idea that that is where their workforce was going to live. 
So at that time, it was mainly Eastern European settlers coming, uh, and they were forced into this overcrowded area in the North End that by design in the city of Winnipeg was to be where a more exploited, undesirable class was going to live. Now, over time, that has changed and that has shifted. Um, and today in Winnipeg, the North End is where there's the highest uh, Indigenous population in Winnipeg. Between the North End and the South End of Winnipeg are these tracks, sometimes numbering 22 across. There are three ways to get uh, either over or around these tracks. You either There's two overpasses and one underpass. Um, for a population where public transit isn't very well served into the North End, there isn't a lot of car ownership into the North End, what this divide does of the tracks is create its own boundary, its own wall through this whole system. And then you move to the picture in the bottom right, beneath that, we go back to Palestine and we see other forms of walls, similar to how that slide is of the West Bank where everything is being cut up. Here you have Palestinian children on the edge of their on the edge of their village, and they're looking out over a settler road, a settlement, and over on the other side of that is another Palestinian village. That settler highway and that settlement does act as a barrier and in a way a wall in inhibiting the village villages to access each other. These Palestinian kids know that in order to get to that other village, they're going to have to go on Palestinian controlled roads, various checkpoints, loop around the settlement, uh, potentially being stopped by the soldiers, being stopped by the police along the way. And this does, it creates its own boundary as well. And then when we move to the slide, the picture on the bottom left, this is when we talked about how reserves being placed into isolated areas in Canada. This is a picture of the community of Shoal Lake 40 near Winnipeg. Now, for years, uh, the community of Shoal Lake 40 um, was on a man-made island in the middle of Lake Winnipeg. Um, and they relied, in order to get to the mainland, so to get to um, major grocery stores, to get medical care, uh, to get to the mainland, they relied on a barge to carry them across the lake or wait until the lake had frozen and they could drive across. The one issue with that is come November and come March, either the ice isn't thick enough yet to drive across, but there is ice so the barge can't go, or the ice uh, is now breaking, therefore effectively creating its own barrier and its own wall. Uh, thankfully, in this past year, um, a road was built called the Freedom Road that now connects Shoal Lake 40 to the mainland. But for generations, uh, this barrier has been something that exists. So I just want you folks to take a moment to yourself to think about what barriers do you see in your life um, that are keeping people in space uh, and away. Another part of the settler colonial process is who gets to define who, what, who is indigenous and who is not. And depending on what your identity is under this state does give you certain amount of rights or privileges or takes away uh, a certain amount of rights and privileges and can also control your movement. What access are you going to have in space? So in Canada, it was the Indian Act that defined who is indigenous. So an indigenous person couldn't say, well, I identify as being indigenous. No, that was something the settler state defined. At one point in time, that definition came from blood quantum, um, and the definition was always changing. Uh, so at one time, you could lose your indigenous status. If an indigenous woman were to marry a non-indigenous man, she would lose her indigenous status, and neither her kids would also wouldn't have it. At one point in time in Canada, if an indigenous person became a doctor, a lawyer, uh, joined the army, uh, became a professional, they could also lose their indigenous status. Uh, and it was a way to assimilate, erase the indigenous population into the settler population. There's a theorist out there called Scott Laura Morganson. Uh, he calls this a process of statistical genocide, this process of 
removing people's identity. And in Palestine, we see this bureaucratic system playing out too. So the I picture of the identification on the left, that is the Palestinian hawiya. Uh, so if you are a Palestinian from the West Bank, you get a hawiya. My friend Samer, that's not him, uh, but my friend Samer has a hawiya. He lives in Al Khadr, which is a community next to Bethlehem. His green hawiya means he's allowed to vote in the elections of the Palestinian Authority. It means he can travel on Palestinian roads in the West Bank, even though there's a settler road that goes right through his land, he's not allowed to drive on that one um, because of his green ID. He's allowed to move around the West Bank on certain roads, not on other roads. He cannot enter Jerusalem, East Jerusalem or West Jerusalem. He cannot, without a permit from Israel, he cannot enter Gaza without a permit, and he cannot enter the 48 or Israel without a permit as well. So given his identity, um, it depends where, what space he can access. Um, it also means that the laws that he ascribes to are both the Palestinian Authority laws, as well as the Israeli military laws. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. The next picture is a picture of Palestinian Jerusalemite ID. And this is a really interesting bureaucratic system um, in that Palestinians from Jerusalem are not citizens of the Palestinian Authority and they're not citizens of Israel. Rather, Palestinians from East Jerusalem are allowed to reside in the city as permanent residents. That is very similar to how when new immigrants come to Canada, they don't become citizens right away. They become permanent residents first. However, folks, Palestinians from Jerusalem are perpetually given this permanent residency status. So for example, my friend Dawood, who's from East Jerusalem, he can track his family from on paper from being from Jerusalem for the last 400 years. And that's just on paper, never mind oral traditions of sharing. Despite that, he live, lives in the city as a permanent resident. And the thing is, is that when you're a permanent resident, your residency can be taken away. And that is something that we are seeing in Jerusalem. So when Israel occupied Jerusalem in 1967, it is almost as if a demographic warfare started to take place. So Israel wanted to maintain a Jewish-Israeli majority in the city. But Palestinians uh, growth rate tends to be higher than the Jewish Israeli growth rate. So how do you control the demographics? One way is through the wall, one way ways through incentives for settlers to move into Jerusalem. Another way is to revoke that piece of identity, to change that piece of identity. So since 1967, over 14,000 Palestinians have had their IDs revoked from Jerusalem. And that might mean they're now living abroad. That might mean they've been cast out into the West Bank. And one of the ways you can get your uh, Jerusalemite ID revoked is because you have to prove that your center of life is in Jerusalem. So Bethlehem and Jerusalem are actually really close together. It's like a 20 minute drive apart. Jerusalem housing prices are very expensive, uh, whereas Bethlehem is a little bit cheaper. So even I think about myself personally, in theory, I live in North York. I don't live in Toronto proper. And I live in North York because Toronto proper housing, I couldn't live there. I can't afford to live there. But I work there. I commute there. It's a 20-minute drive. Um, instead, I live in North York and do the commute. Someone from Jerusalem couldn't do that in Bethlehem because they have to prove that they're living in Jerusalem, working in the Jerusalem, and that their center of life is if they can't prove that, their residency gets revoked. Another example is my friend Rami. Rami went to the United States uh, to study engineering in university. He lived abroad for seven years um, while he was studying. He lost his Jerusalemite sta status. So now when he goes home to visit his mom, his sister, the house that he grew up in, he does not enter he enters through Israeli passport control as a tourist, and he gets a three-month tourist visa to be allowed to be in that space. 
<laughs> and as indigenous people are getting pushed into these isolated pieces of land, um, it's making way for industry and capitalism. And when we see about how industry and capitalism is playing out, we're seeing factories, pipelines, logging, uh, resource extraction. And these actions are often happening away from urban settler population due to some of the pollutants and the risks that uh, go alongside them. And they're, being, they're happening near indigenous communities. If you are currently uh, on Northern Turtle Island in Canada, on Netflix, there's this great documentary right now called There's Something in the Water that unpacks what environmental racism looks like in Nova Scotia. Highly recommend it. Um, but I just want to point out that the, the, the battle against pipelines being built on indigenous land um, is part of this. Pipelines are being built on in, near indigenous communities, um, and they are experiencing the pollutants that come out of them. They are living the hazards. And one example of this is um, with Grassy Narrows First Nation. Now, CPT has been in partnership with Grassy Narrows for over 20 years. From 1962 to 1970, the Dryden paper mill dumped 10 tons of mercury into the river system that feeds Grassy Narrows. As a result, 90% of the community of Grassy Narrows is experiencing symptoms of mercury poisoning. And a report just came out this week that due to mercury poisoning, members of Grassy Narrows are dying at a younger age. For decades, the national and the provincial governments denied that this mercury poisoning was taking place. Instead, they attributed the health problems the people of Grassy Narrows were experiencing was due to the personal and individual choices and decisions uh, that the members of Grassy Narrows were making. Complete victim blaming, blaming. And yet, while today they admit that yes, members of Grassy Narrows have mercury poisoning, for decades they denied it. For decades, the government said mercury poisoning will naturally go away. I'm grateful that today the governments have said that they're gonna work to clean up the river and I'm grateful uh, that they have vowed to um, build a mercury treatment center. But this is just an example of that environmental racism. And we see this in Palestine too. So this is a creek area uh, near Bethlehem. Now Israel controls 80% of the water aquifers in Bethlehem. So Bethlehem residents don't always have access to clean drinking water. But that's not the only challenge that they face. So this would be a creek that shepherds would rely on to feed their livestock, as well as farmers would rely on to, to water their crops. However, Israeli settlements have been dumping sewage and waste into the water areas that Palestinian farmers are relying on. This becomes a form of that environmental racism. This Environmental destruction is not being experienced by the settler community, it's being, um, it's being experienced by the Palestinian community. And we see this in Tulkerem as well. Tulkerem is a Palestinian uh, village, uh, city, uh, in the northern West Bank, and this is an Israeli factory. This is a factory that was previously uh, well inside Israel, and then they decided to move it to the seam zone, so right on the edge of the West Bank in Israel, because uh, the factory owners wanted Palestinian cheap labor. But due to there's a series of factories here, due to these series of factories, Tulkadam has the highest cancer rates in the region. I met with a gas station attendant or a gas station manager who runs the gas station across the street from the factory. He only hires workers on a four month basis at the gas station because he does not want to be responsible for workers dying of cancer. When I met with various um, members of the community of Tulkero, they also mentioned that on days that the wind blows the noxious smelling gas towards Israel, they actually shut down uh, the factories that day. I was not there to witness it, but those are the stories um, that I've been hearing. And then there's the military occupation, soldiers and the security, um, security in, in, in quotations, security culture. So these are Israeli soldiers inside Ida refugee camp uh, in Bethlehem, near Bethlehem in Palestine. It is common to see soldiers uh, in Ida refugee camp, just like it's common to see soldiers in Hebron. Now I want to point out that you can see in the background of this picture, these are kids 
These are kids walking to school because the picture, the building on the right hand side is actually a UN school. And they're walking to school and when they see these soldiers, they know these soldiers are not there for their protection. They have seen these soldiers enter their homes at night, taking members of their family. They have seen these soldiers spray tear gas into their community. They have seen these soldiers shoot rubber bullets and live ammunition at their community members, and they themselves have been shot at. When they see these soldiers, they see a threat to their life. They do not see somebody that will protect them. And that constant threat is something indigenous folks in Turtle Island and Palestine experience. Because I think about my own upbringing, and I spent some time growing up in Saskatchewan. And in Saskatchewan, uh, there was a time when Saskatoon police would pick up indigenous men in the winter, drive them out of town in minus 30 weather, take their shoes and make them walk back to Saskatoon. These were called starlight tours. I've also heard of them happening in Quebec. And also when I lived in Winnipeg, an indigenous friend of mine uh, mentioned that he, when he was growing up, police would pick him up, drive him out of town. He said there was a time that he was picked up, driven out of town, they handcuffed him to a telephone pole, they put telephone books on either side of his head and punched him. He passed out and when he woke up, they were laughing and cashing in the bets uh, because they were betting on how much time he would be passed out for. <laughs> and this threat continues. Just this month, in a span of 10 days in Winnipeg, three indigenous people were killed by the police, including a child. 16-year-old Aisha Hudson, who was unarmed at the time, was shot and killed by the Winnipeg police. And so police and RCMP become a site of threat, not a site of protection. So for me, growing up as a settler, I was taught that police were there to keep me safe. That is a settler, that is a settler message. Uh, for indigenous folks or for Palestinian folks, uh, the opposite is true. And again, I am gonna glaze over the imprisonment and criminalization section. Maybe that could also be part of the part two. Um, but indigenous people in Canada are over incarcerated. There are 3,700 indigenous people in Canadian prison. In Palestine, a quarter of Palestinian men will spend time in Israeli detention. My friend Samer from the West Bay, um, he is currently in prison for the third time. So I'm in communication with his wife and his kids, um, but he's in prison for the third time. Um, indigenous people face daily racial profiling uh, by the police, as well as Palestinians do as well. A friend of mine from Jerusalem, uh, he talks about how, who knows Hebrew, he talks about being pulled over by the police in Jerusalem. And when he rolled down his window, he gave a Hebrew greeting to the police officer. The police officer responded back to him, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were Palestinian. Go ahead, I shouldn't have stopped you. I also just wanna encourage you, this is a painting done by Kent Monkman. Um, and this is a painting um, of him expressing some of his frustration of the over-incarceration of Indigenous people in Canada. Um, I really Google it, Kent Monkman. Um, his artwork is very, very profound. He's an Indigenous artist. Now what this does is, what the settler colonial system does is create a system where Indigenous people are devalued within society and leaves room for a settler mob to enact violence. In Canada, there are thousands of murdered and missing Indigenous women. Um, this is a picture. It's a highway that goes up to Northern British Columbia, actually on the way up to what Sioux did. Uh, this picture was taken by Two Secret Tears. It's called the Highway of Tears because over 40 women have gone, Indigenous women have gone missing along the Highway of Tears. Uh, and this is a huge fear um, about around what Sioux did with the, with the pipeline going there is that there's going to be a creation of these man camps, these worker camps. And we have experiences from Alberta that where these worker camps exist, violence against Indigenous women increase. 
We have stories like Colton Bushy. Colton Bushy was from Northern Saskatchewan. He was a young indigenous man that went out cruising uh, with his friends and he turned into a settler yard, uh, Gerald Stanley's yard. And I just want to point out that being raised in rural Saskatchewan, going cruising on a, there isn't much to do out there. Uh, going cruising on a Friday night is something you do. I have done it countless times where I've gone cruising on a Friday night. You turn into a farmer's yard, you turn around, you leave. Um, so Gerald Stan or Colton Bushy uh, and his friends enter Gerald Stanley's property. Gerald Stanley claims that he is scared and he is under threat. He grabs a handgun and he ends up shooting Colton Bushy in the back of the head, execution style. Gerald Stanley goes to court and he is acquitted on all charges, including the mishandling of a firearm. I just want to point out that when I went cruising uh, as a teenager and as a young adult, I never had a fear that a farmer was going to come out and shoot me in the head. I think about Tina Fontaine. Tina Fontaine was a young indigenous woman whose body was found in the Red River in Winnipeg. Raymond Cormier, a settler, uh, there's recorded, recorded evidence, there's a recording of him insinuating that he is the one that killed Tina Fontaine. Um, and yet he too was acquitted on all, all charges. And Palestinians experienced this violence as well. Palestinian taxi drivers in Jerusalem share repeated stories of them being attacked for being Arab. I think about the Dawabshe family. The Dawabshe family had a, settlers attacked the Dawabshe family house, killing everybody except Ahmed, um, the, the small child um, who suffered uh, severe burns as well. And this is just an article that was released last month because the settler violence continues. And then I think about the killing of Muhammad Abu Khadr. Mama Abu Khadr was killed in 2014. Um, he was kidnapped by Israeli settlers in Jerusalem um, in the early hours of the morning. And he was taken out into a forest and his body was set on fire um, and killed. And so this whole structure creates this, this uh, space for this violence to be enacted on indigenous bodies and the per perpetrators of this violence are not held accountable the same way in the same way. But while this structure in the system is happening, indigenous people are resisting against the structure. They are working for decolonization. And so I think about the community of Grassy Narrows who nearly every year take part in the River Run uh, in Toronto where thousands of people will join the members of Grassy Narrows in demanding that the governments clean up the river as well as build a medical treatment center. And this year, we finally got the announcement that the government is going to do both and listen to the members of Grassy Narrows. I think about what played out in January and February when the land defenders at West Suedon were invaded by the RCMP. Blockades went out across uh, Canada, actions, to, uh, actions in solidarity happened across the world. Uh, and it was all Indigenous-led indigenous action that were saying, no, this is not how you treat Indigenous people. Um, you have to respect um, the, the Wet'suwet'en title and their territory. And this is just a picture of all the actions that were taking place on February 25th across Turtle Island. Mass amounts of resistance that is indigenous led. I think about Palestine. Every single year, Palestinians gather to protest and to demand that they open Shahada Street. Now Shahada Street is a old city street in the middle of Hebron uh, that used to be a prominent Palestinian market. There's Palestinian houses along that street. There's Palestinian businesses along that street. And yet, Israel has closed down that street, has forbidden Palestinians to walk on that street, to open their shops on that street. And every year, facing tear gas, live ammunition, rubber-coated steel bullets, gun trucks, Palestinians go out and they say, open the street. This is our right. I think about youth across Jerusalem, that when Israel goes in and tries to erase the Palestinian culture from Jerusalem, Palestinian youth take to the streets and they say, no, you will not erase us. You will not erase our voices from this place. 
And then I think about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which has in, which has which is Palestinian led and has inspired the world to stand in solidarity with Palestinian people as we work for peace and justice. There are also stories of settler solidarity. In Tel Aviv, every year there's a Human Rights Day parade. Uh, folks march for animal rights, LGBTQ rights, women rights, a whole bunch of other rights. But Palestinian rights and the right of return of refugees is completely ignored and erased from this parade. So this is an example of One Year Zohro, which is an Israeli organization. They said, no, we will not let Israel erase Palestinians from this. And so they created life-size images of Palestinian refugees who've been denied the right of return, and they marched them through the parade as a form of accountability. I think about all the actions that took place uh, across Turtle Island in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en when thousands of settlers came out on the streets of Toronto to stand in solidarity with the Indigenous people. And CPT is there. And this is why I, I mean, I love working with this organization um, because we're there and we're standing in solidarity. And so within CPT, we have the Turtle Island Solidarity Network where we do Indigenous solidarity. We do settler education, so like this workshop. Uh, we do coalition building and we're working to undo settler colonialism. And what that can look like practically um, is in forms of accompaniment. Uh, this past February and March, we were able to send two groups of CPTers out to Wet'suwet'en uh, to be in solidarity with the uh, Wet'suwet'en people. And part of our job was to be there to document the CGL workers um, that were entering to keep full documentation of what was going on, to observe the police, police presence of what was going on. And as well as in Ontario, CPT was able to visit Tyndanaga and express our solidarity um, with the blockade that was there. And in Palestine, uh, CPT is in the old city of Hebron and we are taking our leadership from our partners there. But part of our work there is to walk Palestinian children to school who face harassment from settlers who have to go through checkpoints. We observe and we monitor checkpoints, so how Israeli soldiers are treating Palestinians at checkpoints. We observe and we document when Palestinians get arrested, uh, and we also observe and document uh, nonviolent demonstrations uh, that happen. So what can you do? I know I've thrown a lot of information at you all at once, and I think I'm three minutes over my time, uh, but we really do want to get you involved because decolonization is a collective communal process. Currently, um, our delegations are all put on hold, but when it is safe to travel again, I encourage all of you to go on a delegation to Grassy Narrows or to Palestine. Uh, invite CPT to do an undoing oppressions training in your community and learn more. Get involved in advocacy, boycott divestment and sanctions, uh, learn more about it, get involved in it, get involved in the United Nations Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, and of course, I would love it if you folks could all get involved in CPT as well. Uh, so thank you. I think we're gonna have time for questions now. Um, but I just wanna again say thank you for this opportunity uh, to share uh, the learnings that I have received um, from standing in solidarity with indigenous people, uh, both in Palestine uh, and here on Turtle Island. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, we're just gonna move into our question answer section, but first I just wanna you know, acknowledge that this um, presentation was done in April and there've been so many things that have happened since that time. And, um, you know, we've got the Israeli annexation plan and we've also got the 1492 land back lane. And I just wanted, Rochelle, if you could like speak to a little bit about that. Um, we do have a couple of questions around uh, folks who watched the last webinar and want to know any updates. And for folks who weren't part of that last webinar, maybe we could give a little bit of an introduction to that. Absolutely. So folks, please definitely watch our last webinar um, where close friend, um, Celeste, uh, who's Haudenosaunee, speaks a bit about what is happening at 1492 Land Back Lane. 
uh, which is currently near the settler community of Caledonia in Ontario. Uh, so what has happened is, so very brief, um, is the Haudenosaunee of Six Nations have been promised this huge tract of land through the Haldimand Proclamation. For decades, uh, the Canadian government, the provincial government has been chipping away at the land. Um, sometimes through corrupt sales, sometimes just through theft, uh, and that there are 29 land claims going through the system um, right now. And one of those land claim sites is where 1492 land back lane is happening. And so the settler community of Caledonia is wanting to build a subdivision um, and uh, the land defenders of Six Nations said, you know what, this, this is our land, this is our territory, we have never ceded it, um, this is illegal. And so land defenders from Six Nations have reclaimed the land uh, and they have named it 1492 Landback Lane. Please take a look at some of CPT's stuff, read about it online, there's been lots of things happening. Most recently uh, on Tuesday, uh, there was a court proceeding that actually upheld the injunctions um, on that land. So declaring that um, the land defender's presence uh, on that land is illegal. They're calling it an occupation. This is not an occupation. This is a reclamation. These are not protesters. These are land defenders. And through that injunction, they have also named Skylar Williams, who's a contact CPT um, has, um, as the key defendant. And he could be facing um, serious fines. He was also um, a land defender back in 2006 in the struggle uh, near Caledonia then. And so, I mean, he's very experienced, he's very strong, uh, and they're committed to staying on the land. Thanks for that, Rochelle. And um, I will be sending out those links and we'll be sending, we'll be sending you sorry, an email after this um, webinar with ways that you can take action um, for that. And I've got a question here, Rochelle, um, that is, what actually is Turtle Island? I think that, that is <laughs> yeah. a great question. And so Turtle Island is the indigenous name for North America. And so at CPT, we choose to use the term Turtle Island because Canada, the United States and Mexico were all constructed uh, by European colonizing powers, uh, not for the sake of the people living here on this land, uh, but for capital growth uh, and settler expansion. And so Turtle Island is the, tr is the land of North America. Thank you for that explanation. Um, we've got another question here that asks, what would a Canada that is completely dismantled of settler colonialism actually look like? I don't have one answer for this. And I don't think it is diff very difficult to imagine, but I think we have seen moments of decolonization. At least I've seen moments of decolonization in my lifetime. And so I think to the Wet'suwet'en sites, um, at, in Wet'suwet'en territory, uh, where they were reclaiming and standing firm on their land, they had a healing center. Um, they built their own, their own shacks, their own cabins. Um, they were building their own community and structuring the community the way they wanted to. I think to 1492 Land Back Lane, uh, where you have indigenous leaders uh, through discussion and through listening to uh, the women in the community, creating a system and a structure of how to live in right relationships with each other and with the land. Um, and there's chance for growth there. Um, I've heard of other stories happening out at Six Nations where, <clears throat> you know, creating, creating youth centers out of old police stations um, so that they could be there for the youth. So I can't say, I mean, I think that could be a brilliant conversation we could all have. And I think that'd be a really fun discussion to have. Um, but I can't say that I know this is what Canada would look like. I do know that when we work to decolonize, it is about giving the land back and it is about rejecting this fragmentation um, of land, this, uh, these values, I would say, of white supremacy um, is that's when we start to see these moments of decolonization take place. And to be honest, me as a settler, I'm not going to determine what that future looks like. I'm going to sit back and listen um, and learn about what that future could be. 
And on that note about learning, um, we do have a couple of questions around resources and specifically what would you recommend in order to teach settler colonialism um, to middle school students as an alternative to the usual discovery narratives? Uh, so whoever asked this question, I don't know where you are uh, in, in this world, but there is something called the Kairos Blanket Exercise. And it's an interactive exercise. I've actually participated in it with folks um, in middle school and in high school uh, that sort of tells the history of settler colonialism on this land and the shrinking of territory, the process of residential schools. Um, and it has become a very profound moment for the students that have taken part in it. There's also a few documentaries uh, that you could show just to show a bit about what the relationship has been with indigenous people uh, and the government um, in Canada. And that would be one of, one of those documentaries is called Is the Crown at War with Us? Um, there's also a brilliant podcast that's starting to get more traction in schools in Canada and that is called The Secret Life of Canada. I'll repeat it, The Secret Life of Canada. It doesn't just cover Indigenous issues, but it provides an alternative history to a multitude um, of issues, including that slavery existed once in Canada. And so please take a look at that. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, we're gonna move into um, a question. Oh, sorry, I just wanna say the person who asked that did just write back and said, um, I'm in Canada, Toronto, and our school has had the Cairo blanket exercise with our students. Smiley face. Wonderful. Good. And you can always email me, Canada at cpt.org. Um, and we can grab coffee um, at a, in a park, socially distanced, wearing masks, um, and explore ideas that we can reach out more to your students. Wonderful. Um, we're just going to move into... Um, more about your experiences in Palestine. Um, so we do have a question here about how you coped emotionally in witnessing the injustice in Palestine. And if you intervened physically in any way to prevent abuse, especially if you saw children being arrested. Um, that's a really good question. So the thing is, no matter what I saw or experienced, was never the same as what Palestinians see and experience on a daily basis. There were times that it was emotionally shocking for me. I grew up in a very white settler community in rural Saskatchewan um, and went to school learning that the that you know, the world celebrates human rights um, or that Canada celebrates human rights and going to Palestine turned my world upside down and seeing that what I was being taught did not actually fit the reality of what was on the ground. And there was no amount of reading or watching documentaries that could prepare me for that. But again, um, that ignorance was a privilege in and of itself. Um, I had really close friends there that I could debrief with, but again, nothing I experienced was ever as severe as what Palestinians um, experience on the regular. Um, in terms of did I intervene, um, I w there are moments that you do need to intervene. Uh, I'm not gonna get into those stories, but it is very much Palestinians on the ground are the folks that taught me how to intervene, how to ask the soldiers the question, um, one time my phone was dying and I just pretended my phone was dead and I pretended like I was calling the UN to draft a report because they were holding Palestinians at a checkpoint. Um, but again, that intervention, I was never at risk of, of death if ever I decided to intervene, which is um, what Palestines do face when they choose to intervene. So it's really important to, when you, when you travel to places, when you are, when you're learning about Palestine, if you ever go to Palestine, to take time and, and learn from Palestinians what kind of intervention they want in those scenarios um, and realize that the ability to intervene um, 
and not risk your life is actually a huge privilege that is denied to many. Thanks for that answer, Michelle. Um, we're going to move back to Turtle Island and, um, well, I guess we could use this for other places too, but what do examples of land return from settlers to indigenous people look like? And has there actually been the return of settler agricultural land near a reservation back to the original indigenous owners? Yes, and I'm gonna mess up the story, I think. And so I definitely invite you all to Google this scenario and fact check me. Um, so two years ago, I was up in Northern Saskatchewan uh, in Prince Albert doing CPT outreach. And I met this amazing man uh, named Ray Funk. Uh, and Ray Funk's dad uh, was involved, who made it his life's purpose to return some of his land and the Mennonite church's land up in Northern Saskatchewan back to the Chippewas. This is like, um, this would have been back in the 1940s, this process started. Um, and it is his son, Ray Funk, who I met with that told me this story of how his dad made it his life's work to try and return some of that land back. And eventually, um, it is either a Mennonite church or part of Mennonite church Saskatchewan has actually returned some of the land back uh, officially to the Chippewas, but it took decades and decades. And when Ray Funk's dad passed away, the land still hadn't been properly returned, um, but Ray Funk saw it through, um, saw it through to make sure that it was returned. I invite you to Google it. There is a brief documentary about it uh, done by Brad Leach. Um, I don't remember what it's called, but there are examples of land being returned back. Thanks, Michelle. And in a similar vein, um, so it sounds like a lot of this happened in rural areas in regards to your presentation. If we give all the farmland back, how will we eat? Good question. Um, indigenous people do know how to grow food. Um, so one thing is the process of decolonization is going to have to be a whole system shift. Um, I don't want it to sound overcomplicated. It's going to change how we look at food. It's going to change how we look at food security. It's going to change our entire relationship with the land. It's going to change how we, how we've set up cities um, as well. And so <clears throat> it's, it's not that we're all gonna go hungry. It, it does mean we're gonna have a major shift in how we take care of each other and how we take care of the earth. It also doesn't mean, like some indigenous folks may want all their land back um, and that's okay. But I'm also reminded of working for the right of return in Palestine. Um, and I'm a huge advocate for the right of return of all refugees um, to their homeland in Palestine. Now folks often ask me, well, there's now Israelis living in people's homes or, you know, there's a Palestinian village now where Tel Aviv University is. Are you saying just demolish the entire university? Um, and so there is um, Badil, which is a Palestinian refugee organization uh, and the organization of Zohro, which I mentioned previously in the slide. They have been coming up because people were getting so stuck on this thought of like, well, what are you going to do? Demolish everything, chase Israelis out of their home. Um, they started brainstorming plans that could work. One is the recognition that not all, not all refugees will want to necessarily return. Um, but currently, refugee Palestinians that became refugees that are now living in Canada, most of them cannot return due to Israel's racist policies at the airport. Um, other ideas were, hey, maybe we don't demolish the university, but maybe the ancestors from that village can have free tuition either until through the end of time or through another way. Um, some Israelis are gonna have to move out. Um, some settlers in Canada are gonna have to experience discomfort in the decolonization process. But that's because the settler experience, uh, my experience, I have been receiving comfort based on the exploitation and violence um, of indigenous people. So I may have to experience discomfort at some point. I may have to, I may have to experience those things, but I can also trust that there are people 
that are thinking about these plans that are deciding what they want to do um, with that land. And I'm going to trust that process. Thank you, Michelle. And that kind of leads on to another question um, that people have been asking around um, white supremacy and the connection between white supremacy and settler colonialism. And could you speak more to that and what that connection looks like? Ooh, the connection between white supremacy and settler colonialism. Okay. Um, so I would argue um, that through the settler colonial process, there is the ideal settler. And the ideal settler is somebody who is white, who comes from a Western European background. Um, and this is back rooted in the doctrine of discovery, where it is um, Europeans that were considered human and indigenous people that were considered non-humans on this land. And so when Europeans came here, uh, they decided to transplant their system of governance, their way of being on this land, um, while pushing indigenous people off the land because indigenous people weren't human, they were the human. So that's at the core of the founding of Canada, um, is this European whiteness. And that process also defines um, how one should use land. Um, I could get into the theories of John Locke, but that could get really tedious. But the settler experience defines what does land that land must be productive in order for it to be considered used. And so settlers will even, the settler process even defined what is a civilized way of interacting with the land. And that was cornering it off into private property and making it productive so that the state of capitalism could arise. And then the civilization process continued through residential schools. And so indigenous children were kidnapped by the state, put into schools and civilized um, because their identity uh, was um, considered a threat to the state and it was the white identity that they were supposed to take on. And so they were taken from their family, they were forbidden to speak their language, their culture was denied, they were beaten, they were sexually assaulted um, because it was the white way uh, of doing things. Now how this plays out, and we can see this also in terms of, of racism that, that is experienced across Canada today. Um, indigenous folks are still uh, pushed to the margins. Um, you can when even just you read about in the media how indigenous people are portrayed um, at 1492 Land Back Lane, but you also look at how uh, Black people are treated in Canadian society, um, how people of color are treated, created in Canadian society. Um, they're all of them are created as newcomers, even though the first Black people in Canada came actually in the 1700s before Canada was actually officially a state. Um, the first Chinese people also came to Canada long before the country was actually confederated. Um, and yet, so often, these folks are seen as newcomers, as seen as other, as if the white settler is bringing them in. But there is this desired um, settler identity that is white, that owns property, and is productive within the capitalist system. Um, does that explain a little bit about how this process, I don't want to delve too much into it. Um, I can, I can actually go on on this topic for hours. But one thing is to look at how institutions, institutions in our society are in theory created to protect life. So you look at the healthcare system, you look at the security system, you look at the economic systems, but whose lives are they actually saving and whose lives are they actually protecting? So you look at police brutality in Canada. Um, the other day, I mean, let's look at across our lives. The other day I got pulled over by the police because um, I was driving a little fast um, I got my speeding ticket and I drove home. On the way home, I noticed I have a pocket knife um, in the front seat of my car. Uh, that's because I go camping, I enjoy the wilderness. Um, and on my way home, I thought, wow, I have a pocket knife in the front of my car. Jacob Blake was shot last week on claims that he had a knife in the front of his car. Um, Colton Bushy 
was executed by Gerald Stanley because he said that he was trespassing on land. Trespassing on land in rural Saskatchewan when you're a teenager, that's what you do. And so you can see how these interactions show how white supremacy is very much involved uh, in this system. Thank you, Rochelle. I know we could speak on this for a while. Um, we've got a few people who have mentioned um, the map that you showed of Palestine. And um, one person writes that they were quite shocked to see um, the segmented pieces of land that exist now. And they would like to know how um, the annexation would create more separation um, between different villages and what that might mean for families. I have a lot of opinions on the annexation. Um, Israel annexed Jerusalem in 1967, um, in theory. To me, it, and it's still fully occupied. Israel's plans to annex the West Bank is their claims to land they've already stolen. I think they're just trying to find internationally, they want to internationally legitimize um, the lands they've already taken and divided. Those villages are already divided um, by settler bypass roads, roads that Palestinians can't even drive on. Those villages are already divided by mass amount of checkpoints. Um, this is their process. As you can see from the map, Israel eventually wants to take it all over. Um, one could almost say that Israel has already annexed those lands. Um, it's not written into constitution. I mean, if it's under occupation, they do have to follow the international laws of occupation. I guess if they declare it annexed, they don't have to do that as much anymore. But the plan is for them to slowly take it over and over and over. Um, that land is already gone. That land's already controlled by Israel. Israel controls all of Area C. Um, and so will it make Palestinians being able to get to each other's villages more difficult? It could, but getting to those villages for them is already really, really difficult. Um, I think it's for Israel a step in sort of the international community legitimizing it. So for example, when we look at when uh, the US moved their embassy to Jerusalem, um, the US can move the embassy to Jerusalem. I still know that Jerusalem is not Israel's capital, but the international community started making statements uh, saying that yes, this is now the legitimate capital. And you saw this divide. And I think that's what you're gonna see uh, if Israel annexes the West Bank, you're going to have international countries start to say like, yes, this is legit annexation and other folks saying like, no, this is not legit annexation. But at the end of the day, Israel is controlling um, all of that land. They're facing resistance, but they are controlling, occupying, stealing all that land. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, and a few folks have also asked, we did have already touched on this a little bit through some of your answers to these questions, but can we give specific ways in which folks can get involved either in indigenous solidarity work here on Turtle Island or in Palestine? What are some of the things that we can be doing in our home communities? In your home communities, there are a few ways. One, keep learning, um, watch documentaries, uh, I mentioned before, Is the Crown at War with Us, the podcast, The Secret Life of Canada, um, follow 1492 Land Back Lane uh, on their website, on their on Facebook. Uh, they frequently update a list of supplies that they need. If you are in the area, stop by um, with some supplies that they may need, like water or firewood. Um, CPT currently has a take action campaign around this issue. So please take a moment wherever you are, if you anywhere in the world, you can still write a letter to Prime Minister Trudeau uh, and demand that he honor the sovereignty of the Haudenosaunee people. For Palestine, please take a look at CPT Palestine's Facebook page. Um, but also <clears throat> definitely look at boycott, divestment, and sanctions. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement has been uh, really powerful and really inspiring. Um, and Israel knows that it's working. Uh, and they know that it's working because a couple weeks ago, they arrested the national coordinator for the BDS movement and interrogated him, held him in prison, 
eventually released him, um, but they know BDS is a threat. They have uh, designated millions of dollars to a special department within the Israeli um, apparatus to try and find ways to stop BDS uh, from happening. So please follow the BDS movement. Um, please also find ways to keep learning and discussing. And I also invite folks to have those really difficult conversations with families. Um, I know it's not always easy. Uh, remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, if you have a relative that is not so keen on what's happening at 1492 Landback Lane, don't try and convince them in one night. Um, it's not going to work. Um, but take time to have those discussions, to place yourself in those uncomfortable positions. Um, figure out, uh, and there are some resources out there um, about how to begin to have those conversations. Have those conversations about Palestine. Um, change the rhetoric um, from protester to land defender, from occupation to reclamation. Um, and again, for Palestinians, remembering that they are the indigenous people. Uh, of Palestine. Thank you, Rochelle. And I just want to acknowledge something that um, Susan has written in the chat, and that's that Israel has largely increased housing demolitions under this pandemic and settling more land, absolutely. And our team members on the ground in Hebron have also seen um, settlers take over more Palestinian homes there. Um, so we will continue to, to keep people um, in the loop with what's happening um, in Hebron. And I just want to point this out. At the, the beginning of the presentation, I talk about how settler colonialism is about this process of constantly having to acquire land. This is the system of housing demolitions, of controlling the land, removing people from their homes and demolishing their homes. I just want to point out that right now in Turtle Island, during the pandemic, we are seeing landlords evict tenants at a ghastly rate when a pandemic is still going on. Gentrification. Uh, and evictions is part of this process of removing people off their lands, off their homes, uh, and so that capitalist settler state can keep consuming, keep adding, uh, and taking over more lands. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Suzanne, for your comment. Please pay attention to the, the house demolitions that are taking place, especially during the pandemic. I mean, near Hebron, Israel actually demolished a COVID center that was being built by the Palestinian Authority. Um, so a center that was supposed to prevent the mass spread of COVID uh, throughout Palestine, they went in and demolished it. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, we're almost at time. And I just wanna see if there's any final things you would like to say, um, uh, Rochelle, or um, to the presentation, I know, um, We've just got a question here about where the COVID center was. I believe it was right out, was it just outside of Hebron? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so is there anything final that you'd like to say, Rochelle, before we wrap things up? I just want to thank you all for joining us again today. Um, I know there is a lot of information. Um, let's keep the discussion going. Feel free to email peacemakers at cpt.org um, if you have any questions. If you are offended by something I've said, I'm fine with that. Let's keep the conversation going. Um, if you're excited and you want to brainstorm something, let's keep the conversation going there too. Um, but it's been really great to be able to share with all of you once again. So stay safe. Also still safe is safe. Absolutely. And just to let you know that you will be receiving an email with some of the information that we've talked about today, including recording of this webinar in it. So please look out for that. And please do share these resources with other friends, family, people in your network, anyone you feel might want to engage in this conversation. And as Rochelle mentioned, I just posted that in the chat, our, our email address. Please do reach out with other questions that might come up. Um, sometimes they come, they come up, you know, after we've watch the presentation and we'll be thinking about things for a few days so anytime please do email and as Rochelle said I hope that you all are staying safe and that you're well and it's great to have you with us and please look out for our future webinars so thank you everybody have a great rest of your evening bye